Hello and welcome to this talk is going to be revolutionizing gene expression profiling in clinical management of skin cancer. And I do think as a dermatologist, uh, revolution is not a bad word to describe what's coming and what is now here in terms of genetics and their ability to impact, impact our practice uh, and the way that we handle complex skin cancer. Um, the first thing we're going to talk about here is the acquisition of specimens and how we make decisions for our melanoma patients. And so when we see something come in, like what we're seeing here on the left, uh, that's an obvious melanoma. And we are going to sample this uh, in order for our pathologist to give us good information. What is the type of information we really want from our pathologist? Well, absolutely the most, well, besides the diagnosis, the most important thing here is gonna be Breslow's depth. And why is that? Well, because Breslow's depth, historically speaking, is the most accurate predictor of what's gonna happen potentially on the right part of this slide, which is a PET scan showing a patient with multiple metastases. And so when we're sampling this specimen on the left, uh, we definitely want to give it uh, to our pathologist in a format or in a, in a block of tissue that's not going to transect the base because that's going to be a critically important factor that determines uh, ultimately who's going to go on to have a clinical picture on uh, that we see like um, that patient that is on the right. Uh, and what we do identify from NCCN guidance is that the NCCN guidelines tell us that we should tailor our management of uh, any patient uh, based upon their individual risk of a recurrence. And so that's exactly what we're going to talk about tonight, both with historical perspectives, as well as with modern technology, including gene expression profiling. And so one of the limitations of our current staging system for melanoma is that it will miss certain patients that go on to have uh, either advanced disease or die of disease. And if we look at the circle on the left, it shows that when we are making diagnoses of melanoma, we're actually getting good at this and we're identifying 80% of our melanoma patients in stage one. Hopefully that means that patients are having good access to care and that as diagnosticians, we're identifying earlier and earlier stage disease. Um, so if we're identifying 80% of our patients at stage one and 12% at stage two, I think a sobering fact is to look at the circle on the right, which shows that 60% uh, of our patients who we are identifying at early stages, the stage one and stage two, are ultimately responsible or ultimately 60% of deaths come out of that uh, age group or stage group, the stage one and stage two melanoma patients. And so uh, what this tells us is that AJCC staging uh, for as good a system that it is and the, and the factors that it rely upon does miss a number of patients that go on to die and um, that is uh, disturbing and hopefully something that we can use technology to improve upon. And why do we need to improve upon this? Well, prognostic accuracy is important for any management of any malignancy. And definitely in melanoma, it's been shown that early intervention uh, ultimately uh, improves outcomes. So we're going to talk today about a melanoma test called Decision DX Melanoma. It is a gene expression profile uh, profile test, and it uses the genetic information that is uh, extracted from uh, the biopsy specimen uh, using the RNA um, levels and looking at specific gene expression uh, to help identify um, uh, risk factors. And there's two things that this can be used primarily for. One is to help guide our sentinel lymph node biopsy decision making. And the second is to help us determine how we're going to follow this patient in terms of their overall risk for a recurrence. Um, this assay has been out now for uh, many years and has been supported by studies involving almost 6,000 patients, including both prospective and retrospective uh, analyses. Um, since the early part of this year, 
uh, NCCN has recognized that gene expression profiling may provide additional information uh, in addition to our current uh, AJCC staging, not to replace it, but as an independent uh, additional factor that can help determine risk. And ultimately, uh, some meta-analyses have been performed uh, showing that this data is uh, high quality data that can support a level one recommendation, which is the highest uh, level of recommendation that you can achieve in a sort driven meta-analysis. Uh, and so what does this look like in terms of uh, outcomes that you get from using a test like Decision DX Melanoma? Well, I've been using this test for a number of years and the way that you uh, send specimens to uh, get a uh, Decision DX Melanoma outcome is that you take a block of tissue or uh, slide recuts from patients with stage one to stage three melanoma. These are sent off to a diagnostic laboratory in Phoenix, at which point some of the tissue that contains the melanoma is macro dissected from the slides. Uh, the slides then, uh, the, the tissue that's been macro dissected, uh, RNA is extracted and 31 genes are simultaneously amplified. And the expression of these genes, uh, ultimately a lot of computational biology is performed on them and ultimately you get an outcome that falls into one of two categories. So the first category is class one and that is a low risk of both sentinel lymph node biopsy positivity as well as a low risk for melanoma recurrence. Uh, hopefully most of your patients will come back with this particular designation. Uh, what you don't want to see is your patients coming back with a class two outcome because that is a high risk of melanoma recurrence. Uh, as well, this is also uh, patients that have this particular designation you should consider for sentinel lymph node biopsy uh, assay because they have a high rate of positivity. The class one signature can be broken down into uh, subclasses. Uh, 1A is the lowest risk uh, and 1B represents a low risk, but um, still somewhat intermediate compared to, um, to the 1A. Uh, 2B is the worst case scenario. That is uh, where your uh, genes tend to correlate with a high, um, uh, high level of concern for recurrence. Uh, and then 2A is, a, um, is an increased risk, but not quite as high as uh, 2B. And what the numbers on the far right are showing you is that most clinical reports come back as 1A. Uh, 2B represents 11%, uh, and these intermediate risk groups only together represent only about 15% of, uh, of cases. So um, Decision DX, when you order this, uh, essentially you can be answering two questions and they can be answered simultaneously here. The first is what is the risk for a positive sentinel lymph node? And this historically has been uh, made a decision that's been made by tumor thickness as well as ulceration of the uh, tissue specimen. Uh, the second is what is the re uh, risk of recurrence? Uh, traditionally, this is made by our typical staging factors, which includes breast slows depth, as well as ulceration, as well as the results of the sentinel lymph node biopsy. Uh, ultimately, we then group our patients into either low risk or high risk uh, according to uh, these outcomes. And this is what then drives our decision making. So how do we select patients for the first uh, of these questions, uh, which is the sentinel lymph node biopsy uh, surgical procedure? Well, so the guidelines, which we're using NCN, NCCN as our steering here, recommend that we use sentinel lymph node biopsy at times when our overall positivity is greater than 5%. And so what does that look like in terms of our clinical um, specimens? Well, when you have T1A tumors, and so those are your non-ulcerated uh, tumors less than 0.8 millimeters in depth, essentially your sentinel lymph node biopsy yield there falls beneath the 5% threshold. And so those are that's the reason why we typically do not consider T1A patients for sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure. When do you start to get a sentinel lymph node biopsy return that's greater than 5% positivity? Well, that's in your T1B tumors. So those are your thin tumors with ulceration or your T1As with high risk features. Uh, certainly 
once you get above a, uh, a one millimeter depth tumor, so once you're into the T2s and higher, uh, your yield for sentinel lymph node biopsy goes up uh, above um, the 5% uh, level. Uh, and so once you're at 10%, which is where you are in the T2s, uh, that is someone that you would strongly consider for a sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure. Uh, and so overall, uh, there's a good need for improving how we get patients to our surgical oncologists because there are certainly patients that will not benefit from uh, getting this assay. And indeed, 88% of patients who do undergo the sentinel lipno biopsy procedure ultimately come out with a negative result. So one of the things that Castle scientists set out to look at was, is there a way to enrich for a population of patients that really would benefit from this? And then the other side is, is there a group of patients that essentially could be excluded from sentinel lymph node biopsy? In particular, if you could use something like gene expression profiling to identify a risk group that would have a less than 5% overall sentinel lymph node biopsy positivity. And so um, that's the, this is the question we're addressing. Why improve the selection criteria? Really involves kind of getting the right patient uh, to the right treatment at the right time. And so we do know that um, sentinel lymph node biopsy from being a good prognostic assay still does uh, lack some uh, very important things. And uh, there was a study called MSLT1 that showed that when you do look at sentinel lymph node biopsy, um, and its sensitivity that essentially uh, for being one of the best prognostic assays that we have, uh, when you look at the events that come out of either the sentinel lymph node biopsy positive group or the sentinel lymph node biopsy negative group, that the number of events, which are distant metastases or death, uh, come, there's twice as many events that come out of the sentinel lymph node biopsy negative group as a sentinel lymph node biopsy positive group. Um, so enriching the number of patients that uh, could potentially benefit from this group or for, benefit from this uh, particular assay as well as improving the sensitivity is something that uh, Castle set out to do. And indeed, I think that they've uh, come a long way in helping us uh, identify uh, which patients uh, potentially uh, would be benefited by this assay and which ones also could potentially avoid this particular assay. So Castle set upon this uh, with a group of surgical oncologists, and there have been two studies reported. And together, if you look at both of these cohorts, over 3,000 patients uh, have had this particular uh, analysis done in a prospective fashion. And so what they were doing was looking at gene expression profiling, using it as a precursor to a sentinel lymph node biopsy assay to determine whether or not you could sol better select patients that would benefit from the assay. And this was going to be in T1 and T2 thickness melanomas. So sentinel lymph node biopsy eligible T1 tumors, and then all of your T2 tumors. So everything going up to two millimeters in depth. And interestingly, what they found when looking at the analysis of gene expression profiling with these T1 and T2 tumors that ultimately ultimately went on to get a sentinel lymph node biopsy is that you can indeed identify patients that are either potentially uh, you could exclude from sentinel lymph node biopsy based upon the NCCN positivity thresholds. And we'll start with that. And so if you look at decision DX uh, melanoma results and you get in a T1 or T2 tumor a gene expression profile class of 1A, if you are a greater than 55-year-old patient, uh, if you're in the 55 to 64-year-old age group, your sentinel lymph node biopsy positivity uh, does fall beneath the 5% threshold. It's at 4.8%. And I think even more intriguing is the greater than 65-year-old patient group. Uh, if you have a gene expression profile of class 1A and you are greater than 65 years old with a T1 or T2 tumor, your sentinel lymph node biopsy positivity rate falls below 2%, what, all the way down to 1.8%. And so these are patients who you may consider excluding uh, from a sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure. Were there patients that were identified in either age group um, that potentially could be enriched for an overall sentinel lymph node biopsy positivity rate? Well, indeed, they did find this particular group, and that's going to be anything that is either high risk, your class 2B, or either of your intermediate risk uh, groups, your 1Bs and 2As. 
um, those patients all have not just a greater than 5%, but a greater than 10% threshold, uh, regardless of, uh, of the age here. And so these are groups of patients that you definitely want to send to your surgical oncologist, where you could consider excluding the group that uh, test is 1A. Uh, certainly, Medicare has found this data to be very interesting, and so Medicare is now approving the use of this assay in the greater than 65-year-old uh, age group for uh, making sentinel lymph biopsy decisions. So how does this look in terms of a flow sheet? Well, if you take patients who are uh, essentially sentinel ethno biopsy eligible based upon tumor thickness, uh, all the way up to two millimeters in depth, and you look at their melanomas and then perform the Decision DX melanoma test, and you get a class 1A if you are greater than 55 years of age, um, essentially your sentinel lymphoma biopsy positivity uh, rate falls beneath the, the 5% threshold that NCCN recommends the assay. So in these patients, you could avoid sentinel lymphoma biopsy. If you look at the intermediate or high-risk patients, their sentinel lymphoma biopsy positivity rate escalates over 10%. And so these are patients that you want to offer sentinel lymphoma biopsy. And so the benefits here is that you could potentially avoid unnecessary surgical procedures in the low-risk patients. They're by reducing healthcare costs and overall increasing the yield of the sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure for patients who really could benefit from this particular procedure. So now we'll transition over to the other indication for decision DX melanoma, and that's to help clinicians make decisions about recurrence risk. And so when we see the lesion on the left and we're worried about a recurrence or distant metastasis, uh, we do need to keep in mind that NCCN wants us to tailor our follow-up based upon the patient's individual risk. And so how are we making that determination? Well, historically speaking, it's been with traditional staging tools. And so so this is uh, data from a publication that looked at 690 patients. And if you look at melanoma specific survival, which is on the y-axis there, and you look at the stage of the patients, uh, what you find is that in the 690 patients, your stage one patients do best, which we always know, uh, and they have a 98% melanoma specific survival. Stage two, these patients cross that red line uh, from low risk to high risk with a 90% melanoma specific survival overall, and stage three do the worst down there at 77%. What about can you better stratify out which one of these, uh, which of these patients are going to do better or worse based upon gene expression profiling? And indeed you can. And so if you look at the worst case scenario first, you look at your 2B gene expression profile classification, and you look at the stage one patients, well, very interestingly, stage one patients with a class 2B uh, gene expression profile have a have melanoma specific survival that actually no longer is at 98%, but they cross that threshold from low risk to high risk. And so their 89.5% melanoma specific survival is something that you would see much more consistently with a stage 3A melanoma patient. And so uh, what does that mean for you if you're managing these patients? What it means is that you should actually be upstaging the way that you manage these stage one patients. They're survival rate actually falls uh, to that as you would see in a stage three patient and those patients should be managed like you see uh, like you would with a stage three patient. How about your stage two patients who have a gene expression profile that is class 2B? Essentially, their survival is worse. It's uh, essentially what you see with a stage 3B patient. And then how about a, a stage three patient who already has a bad um, uh, bad news to begin with, uh, and you overlay uh, class 2B gene expression profile, well, their, uh, their uh, melanoma-specific survival is quite poor. Well, if I say that you need to do more for these patients, that essentially they need to be upstaged, what about patients who have a class 1A genetic signature? Well, can you get better than 98% melanoma-specific survival? Well, indeed you can. So the stage one patients with a class 1A gene expression profile have a 99.6% melanoma-specific survival. 
I actually really like this number. I think the negative predictive value here is very, very high. And so I think that uh, melanoma, there's a lot of anxiety that's associated with this diagnosis, both for the patient as well as the clinician. And I find a 99.6 melanoma specific survival to be something that is uh, very encouraging for both uh, myself as well as the patient. Um, what about your stage two patients? So they are in the NCCN high risk. Um, category if you look at these 690 patients. How do they do if they have a gene expression profile class 1a? Well they do almost as well as the stage 1 patients. So their melanoma specific survival is greater than 99%. So they have actually crossed the line from high risk to low risk. So if we're talking about doing more for the patients who are in the high risk area, these would be patients that you may consider excluding from some of the advanced imaging or other types of referrals that you would give high risk patients. Uh, of interest, maybe more so to our medical oncology colleagues than to dermatology, is there are subsets of stage three patients that actually do quite well. And uh, here are some of them. So uh, here are stage three patients that when you have a gene expression profile of class 1A, their melanoma specific survival actually also crosses this line from high risk to low risk. And their overall gene, overall melanoma specific survival is 94.8%, which is much more typical as you would see with a low risk uh, category, such as your 2A patients. Uh, but this is a, uh, a very interesting data set and probably my most uh, interesting data set or my uh, slide that I probably enjoy the most in this entire deck. Let's look at uh, the over 2,600 patients that have been studied using Decision DX, and whether you look at these archival studies on the left or prospective studies on the right, essentially what you see is the same message delivered again and again, which is that your patients with a class one gene expression profile are always on the top here, uh, whether that represents recurrence risk or distant metastasis, uh, they're always going to do better than the red line, which is the lower line, which represents your class two patients. And so uh, what we looked at in that last slide set, in that last slide was the Gassman cohort, which is from the uh, January uh, JAD from 2019. Uh, and what it's showing is broken down on the lower left here uh, by each individual class where your 1A is on top, your 2B is on the bottom, and your intermediate risk uh, layout in the middle. So let's look at the Gassman data just one more time here, looking specifically at our thin melanomas, so our less than one millimeter thickness uh, melanomas. And what we're gonna see on the next slide is, um, well, actually, so before we get to that, we'll talk about uh, the sentinel lymph node biopsy negative group. So I mentioned before that you'll have a uh, cohort of patients who are sentinel lymph node biopsy negative, and we do know that a certain number of these are at risk to have uh, distant disease and recurrence. And so uh, from the Gassman cohort here, there were 54 patients who were sentinel lymph node biopsy negative. And when you overlay gene expression profiling on top, we know that a certain number of these will be at risk. And indeed, if you look at them and you find out how many events occurred, 38 events uh, of, of the 54 occur in patients who are class two. So a class two designation will help you identify 70% of the sentinel electro biopsy negative patients who ultimately go on to have events. So now we'll look at specifically these thinner melanomas. And this is a paper that was published recently from the JID uh, showing that in Australia that um, more people die from thin melanomas, less than a millimeter, than from thick melanomas which is not necessarily intuitive, but once you start to look at the numbers, this does pan out. And so let's look at the Gassman cohort of the thin melanomas there. And um, this shows recurrence free survival, so RFS recurrence free survival. And if you look at uh, your 1As, your 1Bs, and your 2As, for your thin melanomas, those kind of all stratify uh, up top with very few recurrences. 
Uh, however, if you are looking for a group of patients in your thin melanomas that go on to have trouble, um, your 2B patients certainly identify a group that um, if you look at a recurrence-free or recurrence uh, events that occur 40% of the time in that group uh, that are class 2B, that is certainly not anyone's definition of a low-risk population. And if you're looking for staging factors or looking at modern factors such as gene expression profiling, and you're looking at which uh, um, numbers are going to most support a recurrence, essentially the hazard ratio for gene expression profile class 2B is way higher than any of the others. And really the only thing in a multivariate analysis here that is uh, statistically associated with a recurrence. Uh, so your, your most uh, positive uh, or highly, most highly predictive um, risk for a recurrence in your thin melanoma patients. So now, um, this is a uh, study uh, that was this, um, published by Marx et al. The senior author is Clay Cockrell. And basically, they set out to look at recurrence risk in these thin tumors, and uh, looking at, at tumors broken down by every tenth of a millimeter. And so if you look uh, on all comers, and this was 669 patients in this particular uh, publication, and you look at the recurrence rate, what you see for all comers here is that you start to creep up the uh, recurrence risk uh, the farther you get closer to one millimeter in depth. If you look at your class 1A, so your best, um, your best case scenario, do those patients do better than all comers? Well, they do a little bit better. There's not much room to improve, but the class 1As do indeed look better. Uh, but how about your class 2Bs, so your thin melanoma class 2Bs? Well, essentially, they start to have a very rapid uh, uptick in terms of the recurrence uh, risk. Uh, and what you see is an inflection point that looks right around uh, 0.3 millimeters in depth. And indeed, the authors of this manuscript looked very carefully at the thinnest of melanomas, the ones that are less than 0.3 millimeters in depth. And essentially what they found was that in this group, uh, of their 669 patients that no events were found, essentially 100% recurrence-free survival or 100% distant metastasis-free survival. And so what this tells me and has been a practice changer for me is that if you do look at your thinner melanomas, that basically less than 0.3 millimeters in depth, you would have to test an awful high number of patients with Decision DX to really change your practice. And so, um, it used to be that I would order this on any melanoma that was greater than in situ in, um, in thickness. And now um, this is something that I have changed the way I practice based upon this manuscript, uh, really not ordering this anymore on my 0.2 millimeter depth melanomas. And if you look at that uh, class 2B signature, in these thinner melanomas, the recurrence free survival rate um, essentially is down to 75.5%, which is definitely a high risk group. So uh, we talked about decision DX melanoma, a gene expression profile, and decision DX helps us as clinicians make decisions about our melanoma patients. And we uh, have two major decisions that can be assisted using this uh, technology. Uh, the first is what is the risk of a positive sentinel lymph node? And so uh, CASEL has uh, developed an, uh, an assay and an algorithm that's essentially, if you look at all sentinel lymph node biopsy eligible T1, as well as all T2 tumors, essentially you can use Decision DX in the right age patient, so greater than 55, uh, to help determine which uh, patients are going to be uh, better helped by a sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure, and those are your intermediate and high risk class 2B uh, patients, as well as identifying a subgroup of patients who have a gene expression profile that would indicate that these patients may not benefit from getting a sentinel lymph 
biopsy assay. And then the second indication for this uh, assay, uh, which was actually the first one that was developed, is looking at the recurrence risk uh, in particular. And so if we look at decision DX in patients who have a thickness of tumor that is 0.3 millimeters or greater, our, your class 1A is the, going to be your lowest risk uh, patients. Your class 2B uh, represent the highest risk. And I've showed you that this uh, may alter the way that you manage patients patients, uh, which would include upstaging your patients uh, who do have a class 2B signature, uh, as well as potentially downstaging the way that you manage patients with a class 1A genetic uh, gene expression profile to essentially involve less testing and less referrals to your uh, oncology colleagues. And so decision DX melanoma, uh, this is the last slide in the deck, but this uh, tells us that it has been studied and, uh, and over uh, almost 6,000 patients. Uh, there have been over 25 publications published on this particular assay. And uh, this has been used for the last uh, several years and has now um, uh, been ordered by almost 7,000 clinicians uh, with almost 60,000 assays being run. Um, this shows that Medicare has now uh, authorized the use of this test and is paying for this test in uh, the um, using it for its two indications. It's uh, risk of recurrence in greater than 0.3 millimeter, uh, greater than or equal to 0.3 millimeter depth melanomas, as well as in use in guiding sentinel or biopsy decision-making. And so where Medicare has gone, uh, now the VA is also going, uh, which is going to be the use of this particular assay uh, on um, uh, available for uh, veterans uh, who are receiving their care in the VA system. And once again, I'll mention that this uh, has achieved a level 1A um, evidence, uh, supporting it uh, on high quality data with the highest level recommendation for use in a meta-analysis. Um, and uh, most importantly, NCCN now recognizes that this particular assay is an important and can uh, add important uh, additional um, additional information uh, for helping clinicians determine what is the risk uh, for your patients. And with that, uh, we are going to conclude our uh, discussion. And uh, once again, thank you very much for um, your attention to this presentation.